Cool. Yeah, should we get started? We can do. Yeah. Cool. Um, sweet. So I'm Sarah and I'm kind of um, coordinating this webinar and this is Helena. So if you want to introduce yourself, that would be quite nice. Hi. So I, so my talk is about British bats. Um, I do touch sort of on bats more widely, but mostly about British bats. Um, I work in wildlife rehabilitation and I also do bat rehab independently as well. Um, so I've put in a bit about bat care since that's sort of what I'm more familiar with as well as like, sort of legal protection for bats and some of the things that are issues for bats in the UK at the moment. So I don't know how much people know about bats already, but I thought I'd sort of start with some general information. So in the UK, we have technically 18 species um, of British bats. Um, I don't know if you can see the slide. With all the got, I'll get it up now so everyone can. <laughs> I will read them out still just in case people can't see. Um, so we have... We have Alcatho bats, we have Barber cells, Bechsteins, Brants, Brown Long Eards, Common Pipistrels, Dorbentons, Greater Horseshoes, Grey Long Eards, Leislers, Lesser Horseshoes, Nethusias Pipistrel, Natteras, Nocturnal Serotines, Soprano Pipistrels, and Whiskers. Um, so, quite a few, all different names, um, and you'll notice some of them are quite similar. So, we've got Brown Long Eards and Grey Long Eards, then you've got Lesser Horseshoe Bats and Greater Horseshoe Bats. Um, we also technically have the Greater Mousid Bat. Although it was technically sort of officially declared extinct in 1990. Um, although from sort of 2002, there's actually a, a, a juvenile male that was found in Sussex and he's been recorded in the same place hibernating each year since. Um, but it looks like it's just him, which is quite sad. Um, there's sort of a longer story about them and about how it was initially thought they were sort of extinct from the UK a lot earlier. Um, a small roost was found and then it was exposed to quite a lot of disturbance as film crews and people rushed in trying to conduct research, trying to tell the story of all of these bats that they'd found that they thought was extinct and actually disturbed them while they were hibernating, which meant that a lot of them died, which is really sad. But yeah, one of them's still around, one of them still still being recorded in his spot each year, each winter. And the Greater Malsid bat is actually the largest one of the ones that we have in the UK. Um, so if you think that the wingspan of some of our bats is quite significant, and, and yeah, he's one of the largest. The ones in orange, the Barberstells and the Becksteins, are the ones that are um, sort of on the at-risk list that are generally rarer and that we just don't see as often. They're quite fortunate. So I'm based in Devon. We're quite fortunate there. We see a lot of the different bats around but depending on where you live and what's around you if you live in sort of like a newer estate or if you've got a lot of woods around you if you've got rivers or big lakes or anything that'll affect the kind of bats that you're more likely to see if you're walking at dawn or dusk sort of throughout the year so some of these photos are my ones some of them i've pinched um from the website so on the left we have one of my pips that I had, or my pipistrels that I had in care, I think last year or the year before. And then on the top, on the right, we've got a whiskered bat, who, they're quite stressy whiskers, but um, each bat species has quite different characteristics, um, which you get to know as you obviously sort of spend a lot of time with them if they're needing more intensive care. If you're looking after these bats, you start to notice the differences between them and their behaviours. And then the bottom right is a barbastel. So what's really distinct about barbastels is that they're the only bats that we have where there is a joined right at the center of the head. So they're really distinct um, and they are one of the rarest that we have in the UK. So the oldest barbastel that has been sort of registered or recorded in the UK was 23 years old. So most people think that bats don't live all that long, but yeah, one of the barber cells that was recorded, this was actually recorded in 1989 as well. So if you think about all of the data we have since, I'm sure there are older ones, but 23 years old, that barber cell. But you mostly see them in the south of the UK. You don't tend to see them in the north. 
And then on the next slide, you can see we've got a brown long eared on the left. She was a really poorly, really poorly girl that I picked up, um, a juvenile. So she was one of that year's babies. So I picked her up in the summer, got a call out to her. Um, and one of the features about long ears when they're poorly is that they hold their ears sort of straight up. So I already knew that, you know, she was really not in a good way and was quite sickly aside from her weight and things as well. And then on the right is a serotine. So I love serotines. They have really long fur. They're very sort of cheeky and naughty um, in care, but they're really distinct when you see them flying. If you see them flying across the tops of the trees, um, you kind of, you can mistake them for serotines, but they look as big as a bird in silhouette. They look really big because they do have such a big wing, wingspan. Um, but yeah, you notice them if you're out walking. And then on the next one we have, so this is a greater horseshoe, not showing his face. Um, they're the only bats we have that do the sort of typical bat thing of wrapping their wings around them when they hang. None of our other bats do it, but the horseshoes do. Um, and that was a picture taken, where did I take that one? That one was in some catacombs actually, not that far from where I live. Um, a known roost where we go in and we survey and we count how many of them we can find at different points throughout the year um, just to have some information about it. So there's a video on the right, hopefully it will load properly and you'll be able to see, um, but it's actually a video from this project called Back from the Brink that mainly works in Devon with different species that are more rare or, or more um, sort of endangered or at risk from human behaviour. And they managed to find a grey long-eared maternity roost and they've actually got footage of some of the emerging bats. So maternity roosts are um, where bats will go or the female bats will go if they're pregnant and they're expecting their babies. They tend to return to the same one each year but that's their specific roost where they will give birth, where they'll rear their young and then where the young sort of learn to fly before they move on when the young are older towards the end of the season. So late September to October. So hopefully you'll be able to see um, some of the bats actually flying out of it. So if you were stood outside a maternity roost, what's really interesting is yeah. that you'll, with most roosts, if you stood outside them, you'd see typically more activity around dawn and then around dusk. But with the maternity roost, you'll see them back and forth throughout the night because when the pups are too big for the mums to fly with to go and hunt, they have to leave the babies, go out and hunt, go back to feed the babies and then go back out to hunt again. So there's a lot more activity. Um, if you're looking at a maternity roost. But it's really exciting because grey long are so rare and there aren't that many known sites of maternity roosts for them. It was really exciting that this project had found one, found the farm where it was on. Um, they really encourage them. They do a lot to facilitate the bats um, and then manage to record it and get an idea of numbers and the size of that particular roost. So important things. Okay, so we have a bit about vagrant species as well, because bats fly really far. A lot of people don't realise that we'll actually get bats migrating from like France or Spain over here and, and likewise the other way. So the two that we most commonly see is Jeffrey's bat and then the parti coloured bat. Uh, the most common one that we tend to see, though, um, is... Sort of well, Jeffrey's recently, it's been Jeffrey's. There was one scene last year that was in Sussex um and picked up so i've got a picture of it there he looks kind of similar in face to some of the british bats but his coloring is very different and that's actually a worm in his mouth it's not his tongue or anything it's um what we feed <laughs> what we feed the bats so that's a wax worm in there so in care we can feed bats mealworms or wax worms um and he would have been particularly tired and sort of underweight and dehydrated probably either intentionally came over or got blown over um, was fortunately found by a member of the public who rang a helpline, a carer went out to them and then gave them a nice fatty waxworm to make him feel a bit, a bit less sorry for himself. 
Um, sometimes we also get bats brought over here that have landed on ships that have come over, um, sort of breasted in a storm. And this Jeffrey was found, she was found grounded, this one. Um, and they released her after she was back up to weight and she was able to fly after they'd sort of given her a good check over, um, released her really near to where they found her wasn't really an option considering we didn't know where she'd come from they weren't really able to you know take her back to wherever she was originally so they took her back to where she was found um and trusted that she would know know her way back so yeah these bats are generally they're quite widespread across europe through to southwest asia and parts of north africa so you do see them popping up across places and there are sort of previous records the last one before her was in 2012 um, but yeah, it's nice to see. And the parti coloured bat, so the parti coloured bat, we don't have any like them in the UK. So the Dorbentons do look paler underneath, but it's so distinct on these bats, and they are thought to be our most regular vagrant bat, or the one that we tend to record most regularly, um, with it being, yeah, once or twice most years since 2000. So, but I've yet to see one. I'd like to see one, but I've yet to see one. Yeah, them on oil rigs as well. Okay, so true or false, kind of interactive. Some things that people commonly think about bats um, that aren't true and some that I think you might know. So the first one, all British bats eat fruit. What do people think? True or false? I've had a thumbs down. I've had a shaking head. False. What do think? False. False. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So no, all of our British bats are insectivorous. So they feed off of insects. None of them eat fruit. Um, I've been called out to vets practices before where um, a member of the public has found a bat, taken the bat into the vets, and then the vets have been feeding them fruit and wondering why they wouldn't eat it. Um, and no, they don't, they don't eat fruit. So they're not going to eat the nice melon that you've cut up for them. <laughs> Okay, bats are attracted to light. What do people think? The no. thumbs up. I think false. 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 Oh, so false. Okay, yeah, false. So bats aren't actually attracted to light. They're more deterred by it, really, and it can affect their behaviour. Um, I'll go into it a bit more in a minute. Um, but I guess the sort of misconception is more that you get a lot of insects that are attracted to the light and moths and things. And for some bats, that's a great opportunity to eat because you've sort of set up all their food in one place. They don't have to fly across fields and fields to hunt. They can just hunt under a, under a light somewhere. Okay, bats use echolocation to hunt and navigate. Yeah. True. True. Yeah, nice. Yeah, and in the chats I can see. Yeah, nice. That's right. Yeah, so they use echolocation. So they kind of make a clicking noise. Um, it is different actually. So if you've ever seen people walking around with bat detectors or anything, what that does is it picks up on the noises that the bats are emitting and then makes it into a noise that we can hear. And you can identify what bats you know, you're pointing at or you're picking it up because they each echolocate at a different frequency. Um, so that's one way that we can identify bats without actually having to catch them all hands on really nice low stress passive way of um yeah of telling what bats you have in your area okay bats have fin fingers and thumbs oh surely that's ah, true they do have fingers and thumbs so their wings are actually like fingers and thumbs um so they kind of the arm comes out from the shoulder and where it bends this is actually their wrist and their thumb and then the bits that come down from the wing they're actually their fingers so it's kind of like their hands are their wings really which surprises a lot of people but yeah that's her fingers and thumbs <laughs> their thumbs are really important for them in terms of hanging um climbing and sort of crawling about getting about so there we are okay so why are bats important? So in the UK, 
bats are important because they eat so such a vast amount of insects every night so they kind of act as pest control especially in areas of a lot of agriculture because just the mass of insects they consume every night is huge i know people worry that or they have this idea that bats fly into their hair and things or they get too close to them if they're walking really they're kind of picking off the individual midges and things that you've got around you they're kind of like your own little bodyguards um i like to think of it so when you're walking down the lanes between fields at night or something in the summer or in the evenings and they're coming right past you they're picking off all of the little insects that could have been biting you really <laughs> um, they're also really good bioindicators so because the nature of bats and what they eat their diet and how they roost and how seasonal they are means that they're really sensitive to changes in the environment so changes in terms of agricultural practices um, just in local areas as well as well as widespread or sort of trends that you could you could watch through the years of how agricultural practices have, have varied and changed you'll see differences in the bats so they're really good bioindicators you'll often get an idea of how the rest of the wildlife around in the area is doing by looking at the bats so you have a really valuable resource in looking at what our sort of human impact is on the behavior of wildlife around so it's not just agricultural practices, but it's just changes to the landscape development. And um, so like, you know, the development of land, of big green areas, loss of habitat, things like that, woodland, loss of woodland and things. So we can use our information about bat population as well as obviously the frequency and the variety of species you have in an area to give us a really good insight into the impact of what we're doing in our, in our environment, in our surroundings. So that's in the UK, but globally, bats account for about 20%, so a fifth of biodiversity in all mammals, which makes them really, really valuable. There's so much we don't know about them still, but obviously I'm sure everyone already knows that biodiversity is really important. If you want a species to be robust to changes, then you need a lot of diversity within the species. So <laughs> how many fingers do bats have? <laughs> Okay, so bats have, they have four, four fingers and then they have a thumb. So just like our hands. Okay, but yeah, abroad as well, bats act as pest control, bioindicators, and they play a really important role in seed dispersal and pollination as well. Um, the different ways that they feed will affect that as well. But um, through eating certain fruits and then uh, when they defecate, when they're flying, they pull out the seeds and then that's spreading seeds. Um, sometimes they'll get the pollen from things on their fur and they're going from tree to tree each night. So they have such an important role in just the variety of things within a forest, um, the continuity of it, the life of a forest. They're so important. So some of the threats that bats are currently facing um, are ones that you could probably guess. So development, loss of habitat lighting is actually quite a big one there's some studies that have been done into the effects of lighting on bat behavior roads as well believe it or not we do get bats that have been hit by cars um also the lighting from roads just can disrupt their normal feeding or hunting routes um cats are quite a big one we get a lot of bats that have been catted we say or caught by cats um and obviously more houses more estates usually means more pets and more cats which means more bats being caught by cats. Uh, rabies is a big one. And white nose syndrome is quite a current one, which is like a fungal disease that um, is quite highly transmissible among bats. It's killed an awful lot of bats, um, mostly in North America, I think it is. We've not had many cases of it in the UK. I think only one or two. I think two positive cases of um, white nose syndrome in the UK in several roosting sites but thankfully we're thinking that bats across Europe tend to be resistant to it they're not sure why yet they seem to have a natural resistance for it ah it's North America North America they're mostly affected it's caused the deaths of millions and millions of bats so it's quite a serious threat to them so I'll go into lighting a little bit more um, just because it's something that everyone's familiar with I'm sure walking down your streets you're aware of like lighting from houses and street lights you've got car lights you've got office buildings there's just a lot of light pollution around but 
lighting actually has quite a big effect on bats as well as other wildlife. So it can affect the emergence of bats. So emergence is just when they're basically coming out from the roost, so at, at dusk. Some of them will actually take advantage of the increased light. Like I said earlier, if the light's attracting a lot of insects, then some bats actually use that. Um, they've quite cleverly worked out that they don't need to use as much energy traveling as far to hunt if they found one spot where all of the insects tend to converge. Um, but generally, some bats will actually avoid light altogether or artificial light. So some of them, it almost acts as a barrier. They won't come out of the roost, which is then means that they're not going to be hunting. They're not going to be displaying natural behaviors. They might not be going out and mating. It's going to have a, a significant effect on the individual as well as their population and sort of the health of that particular roost. Um, some of them, yeah, like I said, seem to prefer it. But there's also a link between different kinds of light and different colours of light. So there's been quite a lot of studies and research into it in the last few years, um, especially with the increase in development of land around where they're actually asking for this information. They're asking what kind of lighting do we need to be putting into these new estates or what kind of lighting should we be putting into these new builds that we're doing in order to have a decreased negative effect on the wildlife around. So there's um, some research by Emma Stone. She's done a really good, a really thorough paper. It's quite easy to read. Um, I went to a talk of hers, but if anyone wanted to look at it, it's um, with Bristol Uni, but Emma Stone, who's done it. And they basically came to the conclusion that we need to have things like dark corridors in place. So part of her study showed that if there was light along a hedge, a hedge that was typically used as sort of a, a a marker almost for bats. Bats would use that as part of their normal hunting route. They'd follow this hedge before they would go off after they'd emerged. They found that if there was light on half of the hedge, the bats would swap to the other side of the hedge. So they were noticing this change in behaviour um, that was quite significant. So they came up with this idea of dark corridors, planting certain plants, having certain designated areas that meant that they were untouched by artificial light. And so they weren't going to disturb the bats and there was a, an area for them to go. Bats, as well as being predators, are also prey species. So they're not going to want to be easily seen. They're not going to want to feel exposed um, to things like owls, which will hunt them and other birds of prey. It makes a difference. Things like light blocks uh, or timed lighting as well, so that it's only on Sort of for a certain period rather than throughout the whole night and dawn and dusk um, or lighting that sort of targeted and directed the light more downwards so there was less light lost above um, just to sort of keep it as dark where it could be as possible so quite interesting small things like that that you wouldn't think would have such a big effect on them but people are doing research into them and and they do have an effect. So rabies, which was another thing on the list. So rabies is the only known zoonotic disease associated with British bats. Um, I know obviously bats have had a bad rep, especially recently um, with coronavirus and things, but British bats, the only zoonotic disease, which means a disease that can be transferred or transmitted from an animal to a person or vice versa is rabies and it's not your classic rabies that you tend to think of with dogs sort of like foaming at the mouth and things like that this is the european list of bat virus um, and there are two types there's one and there's two um, and to work with bats you actually need to be vaccinated against rabies so if you're handling them you actually yeah have to be vaccinated against it um, it became a lot more of a big thing after a bat carer actually contracted rabies from caring for bats in early 2000 um, and died from it which was really horrible so they're hot on it now um, it is a risk we are seeing more cases of it we are starting to see areas that we knew were already kind of hot spots for it it seems to be bleeding out so if you ask and sort of speak to carers especially in the southwest you'll hear more and more cases and positive cases of rabies so that's something that it looks like is going to be more and more prevalent and more of a worry in the future 
which is disappointing. So what happens is if as a carer, if you have a bat that's behaving suspiciously, so there are certain behaviours that you would tend to link with rabies, things like shaking and head tremors, just abnormal behaviour. You get quite good at reading bats and knowing what's normal and what's not. Um, they're usually suffering quite severely as well. It's a really nasty disease. So after you would have the bat put to sleep, you would send it off to AFA um, and they would do passive testing on it and basically get back in contact with you and let you know, at which point you have to contact the member of the public, um, which is obviously a scary thing for someone to do. Someone's gone out of their way to help this tiny creature that they've found or that their cat's brought in, um, thinking that they were doing something really great. And then suddenly they're worrying about the animals that they have at home, if they put them at risk um, and what's going on. So it is a scary thing. But um, yeah, unfortunately, it's picking up more pipistrels, if you remember. So we have three types of pipistrels in the UK. We have common pipistrels, soprano pipistrels and enthusiast pipistrel. Um, we're thought to not be able to carry it. But this year just gone, there was actually the first case in a pipistrel as well um, detected. They're hoping that it was just a sort of spillover effect from roosting in an area with bats that are found to have rabies, have rabies or be susceptible to it. But um, it means that they've actually started retesting pipistrels when they didn't bother testing them before. So that's another another worry, another threat to our, our bats here. Okay, legally, I tried to make it more sort of basic in terms of legal protection of bats. I know that a lot of people find it quite confusing about what they can and can't do. Um, I get a lot of calls from people who find a bat and they don't know if they're allowed to help it or not because they generally people kind of know that you can't do anything with bats it's like bats are protected you can't do anything um, there is a grey area like with all wildlife where if you're trying to help them or sort of prevent suffering relieve suffering then you are able to interfere but the main legislation relating to bats um, that we have is the Wildlife and Countryside Act of the Conservation of Habitats and Species Regulations, the Animal Welfare Act and the Wild Mammals Protection Act. So all of that summarised kind of means that it's all about intention. So you cannot deliberately destroy a roost, uh, prevent access to the roost, so block up entrances and exits of a roost, um, disturb a roost. So you say you had a roost in your attic, you're technically legally not allowed to go up into the attic into that roof space if you know that they're there um, and you're not allowed to inflict injury or death intentionally in bats so it's kind of it's all about intent so that's where the gray area comes from obviously areas where they're developing um, like there's housing development or people are building on their land or cutting down trees and things that's where it kind of the lines blur a little bit. So if you knew that there was a bat roost in a tree and you chopped it down with no mitigation, no consulting of an ecologist, no one there to survey the bats or the roost, no mitigation or anything in place, that would technically be illegal. But people tend to find a way through it by consulting local ecologists. Um, speaking to experts in the area and working out some kind of mitigation so you might have seen bat houses be built which are structures built specifically for bats depending on the species of bat each species needs a different habitat so will need some different mitigation um, bat boxes being put up on other trees around in the area and waiting for them to naturally move to those there are ways around it um, but yes, generally, it's all about intention. If anyone intentionally harms a bat or a roost or destroys it, then that's illegal, which you would hope anyway, really. So, bat care. Like I said, so it's completely fine to offer help to any suspected injured, grounded, unwell, orphaned bat that you find. Um, and the Bat Conservation Trust, which is kind of the big bat people of the UK, runs a helpline. So it's a specific number that members of the public can ring if they find about or if they're worried about bats in their house or they want more information um, and just sort of be referred on or just have a chat. They have a lot of really good resources on their website too in terms of what it's like to own um, a property with bats. 
and yeah, living with bats. So I am registered with the BCT as a carer and sort of bat ambulance driver. So say someone here found a bat, you'd probably type into Google, I found a bat, I don't know what to do. The first thing that will usually come up is the Bat Conservation Trust helpline number. They'll put you in contact with someone in your area um, who's not that far from you and then you'll give them a ring and then they'll come out and, and sort of see to you about the bat that you found and, and take the bat off your hands. Um, it's all voluntary, so it's all round by volunteers. Don't get paid for it. There's no sort of support for feeding them or housing them or anything like that. It's all voluntary, people coming out to see them um, or to have a look in your house. <laughs> I've been up in people's attics and roof spaces before COVID um, where, you know, they, they said we had a bat come from somewhere and we don't know where. Had bats in their children's potties, bats under tumble dryers, bats in people's bathtubs, under their beds. Um, they're like, well, there's a tiny gap up there. So I go up into the attic. Sure enough, there's all of this bat poo where there's a tiny hole and in between the lining or in between the two sort of rows of bricks in the wall is a roost in there. <laughs> and so having a maternity roost, having these inexperienced young baby bats that are just learning to fly, they're finding themselves in all kinds of places. Um, <laughs> yeah, including children's potties, thankfully empty potty, but all kinds of places. Um, but another thing to do if you find a bat is to take them to your local vets. So vets, um, sort of they have an oath that they commit to when they become a vet. It's like a duty of care and, and prevention of suffering, really. So they do have a duty of care to wildlife, too. Um, and generally, they're better able to look after a bat than someone who knows nothing about them. Generally, apart from the ones that try to feed them fruit or slugs. From, um, from the car park, which I've also, I've also been out to before. Um, but generally, again, most wildlife casualties, the best thing you want to do is to make sure that they're really secure. You want to make sure that you're reducing stress as much as possible so they can actually get through the tiniest of gaps. So something like a shoebox is really good or any kind of cardboard box really that you can secure with some tiny, tiny air holes in. Um, if you can put sort of two fingers in a gap, then a pipa stroll can easily get through that gap. Um, people don't realise how, yeah, just how agile they are and how much they can squish themselves. But you want to keep it somewhere warm and dark and quiet. Put something in with it that it can hide in and um, ideally put like a little cap of water in with it or something until you are able to get help. Um, one of the good ways to do it is if you've got an old tea towel or like an old flannel or an old shirt or something to save someone who's not been vaccinated against rabies from handling a bat, you can put it sort of over the bat and scoop them up or put some gloves on and do it just because rabies is transmitted through sort of saliva, so through a bite or a scratch and then if they were to lick it or if you've got anyone you, that's how it's transmitted and if you're finding a bat generally it's going to be because it's injured or it's unwell it's going to be more likely to bite they're not bitey in nature but like any of us we're particularly grouchy when we don't feel very well or if we're in pain so they are more likely to bite if you're finding them in the first place so on the next slide there's a picture of just sort of like a typical setup so you can see the tiny little air holes in the top of the box and um, they've got like a nice tea towel in there and a little cap of water so yeah, and I've just said about biting them, or well, not you biting them, but them biting you. <laughs> um, well, they are more likely to if they're in pain. Hello, mate. You'll get them, people have had them again on their curtains and their sheds and all sorts. You'd be surprised where, where you'd find them. Sometimes they just need some short-term care. Sometimes they just need... Um, a bit of rest and warmth they just need feeding up a bit waiting until the weather's sort of stable you want to make sure that it's not too cold that you haven't got sort of really strong winds and a lot of rainfall and then releasing them some of them sometimes require more long-term care um, it's a sort of ethical question with wildlife rehabilitation on how long you should keep them for um, because of the stress of being in captivity and, and the stress of recovery, you want to make sure that the benefits um, and their sort of chance of survival and, and able to 
ability to live a normal life back out in the wild are decent enough to to justify keeping them in captivity and exposing them to stress for longer bats are a species as a whole that tend to do quite well in captivity they tend not to display too much stress some species more so than others but sometimes you'll have to have a bat over winter sometimes you might have a bat in care for a year Mm -hmm. in which case you have to apply for for a special license to hold on to them for that long but like you said or like you saw at the beginning there was um one of the bats that they found one of the barb cells that was 23 years old so they do live a long time so if nine months in care means that they can go on to live another 20 in the wild then that's something that you consider in your decision so on the next side we have gray um i very inventively named her gray oh god it's batman <laughs> she's cute isn't she so no i want to stop its fucking head in so this is a gray long ears um which you might remember from the beginning gray long ears are quite rare so this was a gray long ear that i caught, got called out to not last year but the year before um she was a juvenile and someone found her um just hanging from a plant pot in their back garden so a plant pot on the ground so if a bat's near the ground or on the ground you know that it's not not doing so well if you eat a bat what happens is there any kind of virus it spreads so she was really young and you can actually i don't know i ate her eat. she was tasty sorry i don't know what's happening i think dude i just want to get up. a bat and i just want to beat the shit out of that bat like I just want oh to beat God. the shit out of that bat. I, I just want to smash them. it. They look really tasty, don't they? Mmm, yum, yum. I think you've been Zoom bombed. Yeah, I think so. What are you doing? Um, is that all of them, do you think? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Sorry about that. That's all right. That was interesting. Um, They've managed one second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well done finding them. Yeah, I don't know how that. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that was good admin work. Well done, Sarah. You Thanks. Know so work. yeah, I got like five people come in at once, and then um, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if. Okay. Yeah. Ah, no. <laughs> Ah, yes. So, this is Grey. No one kicked her head in or anything. She was just (laughs) attacked by a bird. (laughs) Um, So, she, yeah, she was one of that year's babies. So, she was almost fully weaned. So, she was about six weeks old. Um, Thankfully, this family found her in their back garden. And you can actually, I don't know if you can see, but on the the sort of left-hand photo... She actually had a broken tooth. Um, her wings, you can see from the, the top photo. So those bones, those pink bits are the bones. So they're the fingers of the wing and they shouldn't be curved like that. So we didn't know if she had metabolic bone disease, which is something where um, a condition where basically if they don't get the nutrients they need when they're growing, the bones can't form properly. So they can become sort of curved um, and bent out of shape. Um, or we didn't know if they were fractures. I It was quite late. I'd driven an hour to go and pick her up. Um, it was dark outside. I was examining her in my car, um, opened up her wing and was looking at it. And I thought that she just had loads of fractures. I thought it just didn't look typically like metabolic bone disease. You can see how big the wing tear as well um, was on one of her wings. She had lots of smaller ones too. She was in such an awful way. Um, she actually had a compound fracture so in one of her fingers um, you could actually see that the bone had broken and then it was protruding outside of the wing membrane um, she yeah there was blood there were she was covered in mites she was underweight but she was so feisty um, usually with compound fractures your first thought is going to be that the bat needs to be put to sleep um, it's not something that it's going to be easy or even possible maybe for them to recover from she had a number of injuries she was young um and 
yeah, my first thought was that I'm going to have to take her to the local vets and, and have her put to sleep. But she seemed so feisty and due to the position of that compound fracture, there was a chance that it could heal. So they, um, so the bones in bats, they do this amazing thing where if it's protruding from the membrane, it'll actually turn black and kind of die back and the bats will actually gnaw at it as well. So bats have been known to self amputate before. Um, thankfully the people found her and I got to her before she started to do any of that and do any sort of more serious damage from, from chewing at it. Um, but it's amazing, they'll chew at the bone after it's died back and then the, the membrane can kind of regrow over it. And wing tears, wing tears that aren't straight down, wing tears that have that sort of surface edge the whole way around can grow in from the edges. Um, so I knew that her injuries on their own apart from her jaw, because I wasn't sure if her jaw was broken or it was swollen, um, they can actually heal from on their own. But she was so feisty that I didn't feel completely confident in taking her to the vet to be put to sleep straight away. So I rang a friend of mine who um, is a carer who's been working with bats for almost 10 years now. Um, and I said to her, like, look, I've picked up this bat. She's in a really bad way, you know, she does blood, she's got compound fractures, she's got wing tears, don't know if she's got a broken jaw, she's really thin, um, she's just in such a bad way, but she's so lively and she's so feisty, but would you be willing to give her a go, would you be willing to just look her over, like, I know that I'm an hour away from you, but I'll drive another hour, would you be willing to look her over and just say, you know, if you say that she really does need to be put to sleep, then that's fine we've decided it together i'll take her to be put to sleep if you think that she maybe stands a chance then i would much rather double check just in case um so poor gray i subjected her to another hour in the car um but got to my friends we looked her over one more time in the proper light which is where we took these photos um dosed her up with pain medication because bats can have metacam or meloxidil which some of you might be familiar with if you've got pets it's what you use for like cats and dogs as well it's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory um, so we gave her some painkillers and some anti-inflammatories on the advice of a vet that we work with that we could ask about um, and that was basically the first night the first night was us trying to get rehydration fluids into her we didn't want to overload her system by giving her food too quickly um, we didn't know how long she'd been without it so really especially with bats the most important thing before food is hydration so um because they have a really high urea concentration um what will get them first or what will kill them first or make them really poorly is a lack of access to to water or to hydration before food so we didn't even try feeding her we didn't want to overload her didn't want to shock her system it was just trying to drip by drip sort of every half an hour offer her some rehydration fluid which was hard because handling her she was in pain already so we gave her the pain medication we did that and that was her first night and she kept going so we kept re-evaluating we both wondered if it was the right thing to do to keep her going sort of a bit longer and a bit longer but every day she just seemed to do a little bit more she just seemed a little bit more herself a bit less stressed a bit just not quite as in pain and we started to see the difference in her fingers, the curves and the sort of kinks in her finger bones started to become straight. The smaller, tiny wing tears in her wings started to heal. Um, her tooth, her broken tooth actually became an abscess. So she had to go on antibiotics for it. She was still on the pain medication anyway, because she'd been through a lot. She'd been pretty battered. Um, so she was suffering sort of with all of that quite a bit. But we were giving her antibiotics that treated the abscess she had until her tooth fell out. <laughs> then we started to see, because we were having to hand feed her at that point, then we started to see that she could actually self-feed and move around. So she started to be able to chew the mealworms and things on her own. So where we were worried before about her having a misaligned or a broken jaw, we could see that she could actually eat. So that was really positive, but we were still wondering if she would ever be able to fly 
um, if it was right to keep her going, if we couldn't guarantee that she'd be able to fly when we're looking at such a long recovery, she was going to be in care for, you know, at least six months, which is a decent chunk of time. Um, but she just continued to do a little bit more and a little bit more. We weren't handling her every day, but we could see that she was putting on weight. Um, we would leave her for maybe a week before we would get her out and have another look at her wings. We didn't want to keep opening it. The membrane's so delicate and where hers had been exposed to so much trauma, instead of being nice and sort of stretchy and almost elastic, it became quite dry and crisp. So my friend was bathing her wings to try and help that because she couldn't groom herself properly. Bats do this really sweet thing where they stick out their wing and they kind of push their wing membrane over their nose. They have this gland here. Um, they excretes this oil and they use it to groom themselves and she wasn't really able to do that so we would pull out her wing and have a look really gently and we could see as it was starting to prove and, and improve and, and as the wing tears almost disappeared the big one healed up until it was so small kept getting better she started to groom herself it was just it was so exciting she had such a personality this individual bat um that we just, we just kept going with her, kept going with her a bit more and a bit more um, until one day we actually unzipped the sort of flex that she was in, which is kind of like, um, it's hard to explain, it's kind of like got black mesh on a big box essentially, so they've got room to sort of crawl about in and we hang towels inside for them to hide in, they can move towels, bats naturally have different roosting places um, depending on like temperature and weather and time of day and night and season anyway so you want to kind of when you're um, creating like a setup or accommodation for a bat you want to try and replicate the things that they need to do as best as possible so she had lots of different towels and one day we opened the flex to get her out to weigh her and she flew out of it and did a little laugh of the room and we were so amazed because we weren't we still didn't know if she'd ever be able to fly but she flew and she did really well on that first one and it was just such an amazing moment after watching how far she'd come and that was I think that was maybe three months so if you think that's 12 weeks to heal from like a sticking out bone um, and wing tears and a like head injury like head trauma uh, an abscess tooth the loss of a tooth internal damage as well like she would have been inflamed she would have been mentally traumatized as well from being attacked by a bird especially so young um she would have come away from maternity roost before she would have been ready to naturally disperse so she obviously left her mum and all of the others in the roost everyone that she would have learned that natural hunting and foraging behavior from in that area um, and she left it all but it only took her 12 weeks between that and then being able to fly it was amazing um, and then we started to test whether or not she could hunt whether she could still catch things she could catch things fine moths um, mosquitoes whatever was in the room they I mean long ears particularly love moths um, and she was just able to fly around and catch them. Her hunting was great. She showed no weakness in her flying at all. It was just amazing. She was the most incredible bat that I've ever met. Um, and then we were able to release her finally last year. So in spring last year, um, we were able to release her. So we released her with some brown long ears that she'd been grouped with in care because they'd all kind of bonded together, these juvenile um, brown long ears. And we released them uh, in a field. So we did kind of a soft release. You can get these really great bat boxes um, called Schwegler ones, which are made of concrete um, and metal. And they're just very good. They're very insulating. They're the perfect shape for them to roost in. So we left some food in there. We went back to check them each day. But we put them right in between where we knew there was a grey long-eared roost. And we knew there was a brown long-eared roost. So that she would have the option of either going with the brown long-eareds or flying about until she saw or heard some of the other grey long ears. Um, and she was gone the first night. She was gone. So exciting. Um, and I didn't, obviously, because we did a soft release, I didn't manage to film her flying off. But I have got another video on, I think, the next slide or the one after of um, a brown long ears I released. Hopefully, you'll see it okay. Obviously, we tend to do releases at dusk or dawn, so the lighting's never very good <laughs> for filming it. 
but hopefully you can just about see the, the outline of um, this brown long ears I had. Um, oh, I don't know if it's going to let you. No, I don't know. I could oh, always share uh, your screen, I think, if... Oh, yeah, I'll see if I can. Yeah, cool. I'll give you... Um, I think this might work. Oh, that works. Yeah. Host disabled attendee screen sharing. Ah. <laughs> oh, after earlier. I don't know if it will let me. No, I'm not sure it will. Sorry. That's okay. That's a shame. I thought it would have been interesting for people to see. But basically, what you kind of do is hope for the best. So after you've spent all of this time and you've got to know this back, and it spent all of this time with you and you've sort of gotten up through the night with it or you know you've sort of had to flight test it you've been weighing them each day you might have been having to hand feed them if they weren't self-feeding which means having them with smaller bats like pipistrels and things you have like a cotton glove that you wear so that you're not getting your oils on their fur and on their wings but also to protect you from if they do bite you um, and you have to feed them mealworms one at a time. Sometimes they're really slow eaters, so you'll sat there for ages. And when it comes to release them, you just sort of hold your hand out with them inside the glove um, after making sure they've warmed up. And then they just take themselves off and that's that. And you just hope that they're okay after, <laughs> after everything that um, you've seen them go through. Sometimes they almost do a little loop around you, which is quite nice before they go off. I've been really fortunate a lot of the bats I've picked up have come from lovely places so I've got to release them in, in lovely places too areas which seem just like the best place for bats the best habitats lovely big fields with massive trees running along the edge of them um, or with like rivers just full of bats already you can already hear all the other bats that are there um, and then yeah wish them luck and I hope that they go on okay <laughs> um, but it's really important before releasing them that you warm them up so they kind of shake uh, and twitch their muscles to warm up before they start flying some of the bigger bats actually need longer so you'll know if you've got horseshoe bats in your attic or something if you find a line of bat poo that tends to run in line with the apex of the ceiling because they have to fly up and down and up and down the greater horseshoes until they're warmed up enough to be able to go out and hunt um, but yeah, you'll see them warm up. Bats actually purr as well, which most people don't know, but bats will actually purr. And it's quite similar to when they're twitching their muscles and, and warming up um, when they're happy. They're so expressive. Um, but yeah, I hope that that, I don't know, gave people a little bit more insight into bats and caring for bats in this country. Um, yeah, what do people think? Are there questions? Yeah, I was wondering if um, people want to maybe type the questions in and then we can go through them in order. That might be quite nice. Mm -hmm. I've got a question actually quickly. Um, I was wondering about um, like their breeding patterns, if there's a specific time of year or if it's just yeah. all year or within like around hibernation or something. Yeah, it is. So um, we actually, you see the pattern in care a lot as well you kind of know before you even answer a call from a member of the public what situation you're going to be going out to. So summer is kind of baby bat season. So from May, really, there's not all of the species give birth at the same time. There's kind of staggered. Um, we joke about having whiskered week as well. There seems to be one week a, a year where all of the carers <laughs> seem to get whiskered and not really outside of that week. But um, after baby season, once they start dispersing, so from sort of September time really, until it starts cooling down, is when the um, mums will go off and all of the adult males, there'll just be a lot of activity. So that's mating season is right after the pups have dispersed once they've grown up. Um, and that's when we as carers and people on the helpline tend to get a lot more calls about um, catted males, or just males that have been so driven um, to make, they've got themselves in all kinds of situations um, or they've become quite underweight because they're spending all of their time uh, trying to find females instead of eating and hunting and things like that, not picking the best places to, to roost. 
Um, but yeah, it tends to be at that time of year, that's when our British bats do it. So from September until kind of late October, really, depending on how mild the year is. And then bats, uh, like a lot of British wildlife or like a lot of mammals, do delayed implantation. So the mothers won't actually start sort of allowing the egg to develop until like the cues of nature in terms of lighting and temperature tell them to in the spring again and then that's when gestation really starts but um yeah they use up all their energy just before winter so in autumn they use up all their energy mating then suddenly have to try and put it all back on all of the weight and like a big feeding frenzy so they've got enough reserves to be able to become torpid for longer and longer over winter or hibernate through winter to last them Cool. Thanks. <laughs> I think there's some questions. Um, the first one's from Ian. Are bats in the UK impacted by climate change? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure they are. Um, I don't know of any studies that I can quote off the top of my head. Um, but yes, definitely. So obviously anything in the UK that's going to be affected by climate change. So whether that's what kind of crops farmers are able to grow, what's more you know, economically friendly for them to grow, um, shifts in the diets of people, again, depending, and then just all of the, the chain of, of effects of what we can grow and, and the temperature and, and the weather that we have in this country is going to affect what we can eat. And that's going to affect what kind of insects we have around. It's going to affect how um, huge spaces, like spaces of land are going to be being used. It's going to affect, well, I mean, maybe a more convoluted route is obviously climate change is going to lead to a lot more migration and immigration which means more housing is going to be needed throughout Europe and including in the UK which means again more loss of habitat um, unless we're doing more of these mitigation things um, which again will affect bats and other wildlife so yeah yeah definitely and in in so many ways that I don't even understand um, the next question is, how successful are the take-up of artificial bat boxes? My box has lain empty for years. <laughs> yeah, sometimes they do, which is really, <laughs> which is really annoying. Um, it all depends on the kind of box you have, um, what bats you have in the area, and then where you've put it as well. Um, so it depends. So if you put a bat box up in, say, um, well, late autumn, you're not going to really see any use of it that year probably if you put it up early spring of a year then you might see use of it that year um but which direction it's facing will have an impact um so yeah what side of a tree or a fence you've put it on will impact it what else is around if it's going to be easily accessed if bats are going to feel quite vulnerable as soon as they emerge from it if there's not a lot of coverage around it if there's too much coverage depends what bats you've got in the area as well so there are different types of bat boxes you've got sort of your basic wooden ones which are slanted they have the ridges along the back and um, you'll find like pipistrels and long ears will use those um, you've got the schweglers like I mentioned which are the big cement ones um, that kind of hang and you'll get different species in those different species have preferences for, for different boxes and it will depend on the amount of sunlight you get on it but if it's been a few years and you're not having any luck then definitely try moving it to a different place um, yeah just try moving it about and hopefully you'll get some activity in it that's great you have them up though <laughs> Um, next question is, what is your favourite bat? Ooh. I really love the long eards. They, um, they're really, they're just, they're quite naughty and quite sweet, some of them. They are, I had a brown long eared once that I had to have for, I think, maybe about four or five months. And he would run up to the top of the container when he would hear me get home from work and walk into the room, run up to the top and start chittering away. <laughs> at me um which he stopped doing once he started to feel better and put on weight so I assume he obviously just associated the sound of my voice with food um but they have such character such character and when I was then able to mix him with a group I could still tell which one was him if I was handling them all to weigh them afterwards um you do kind of get to know them um 
they're each so different but I mean I guess from personal experience the long it's and the serotines as well are amazing I've only known I've only sort of come across two barbastels which again is more than some back carers so I'm quite fortunate um, and one of them was so strange so strange that I don't really have a frame of reference for normal barbastel behavior so yet to be determined my ultimate favorite but I do currently really love long ears <laughs> I think the next one is what's the best way to support bats in your area that's a really good question Ooh. I guess awareness really um, it depends sort of what kind of area you live in. I'm really fortunate. I live in um, like a really lovely village in the countryside. Um, and just through talking to people, I'm kind of getting more of an idea of what people see around them. Um, who like some people are like, oh, yes, bats. Oh, well, I see them every night in the summer. They're always in and out of my attic and things like that. Um, so I think just honestly in your area just talking to people getting to know what's around um organizing maybe bat walks just being aware of it obviously things like um having quite a wild garden having wildflowers anything that promotes insects again it's going to be really good um things like night scented stock is something that's really good to grow attracts a lot of insects and moths um which again means that there's food for bats just being mindful with changes to your house um, externally, things like outhouses and things. You can actually get these really cool bat boxes that um, are like built into roof tiles or bricks that are built in bat boxes and you can get it for bird boxes too. Um, so just chatting to people, making people more aware of it and then people doing smaller things that just make things, make their houses, make their gardens and spaces more encouraging to bats and um, more bat friendly. Um, the next question is, we know bats are enemies with cats, but are there any an other animals that are symbiotic with UK bats or perhaps animals that can indicate that bats live in the area? That's a good question. Um, so not really symbiotic relationships um, in the UK. Well, there's none documented. They don't really work with other species. Different species of bats will occupy similar roof spaces. Um, sometimes you'll find like pipistrels at one end of a roof space and long ears at another um, so sometimes you'll find them together there are some pairings that are more common than others some that you generally never see um, again in the catacombs like the picture from earlier of the horseshoe bat um, that was a lesser horseshoe bat in the catacomb um, you'll often find other myotis bats there as well so myotis is kind of like a genus of bat that we have quite a few of in this um, in this country and um, yeah, you'll see relationships between different species of bats, but generally not between bats and anything else. Um, animals that can indicate that bats are living in the area. Not indicators, no, no. I mean, you'll see common things just due to the similarity of habitats for certain species, but not an indicator, um, not like a sure, or a guaranteed link between the two. But like I said about um, owls earlier, predating bats and birds of prey, if you've got owls in an area that are generally, they're generally gonna be in a wooded area where there's going to be a lot of good hiding places for small mammals, for voles and shrews and things like that anyway. Um, it's likely to be an area that bats are also going to find good to live in. Um, nothing i've nothing that i know of and i've not seen any research on it but that would be interesting i don't think there is a direct link between any two but it would be very good to know if there is i'm sure globally there are definitely links between some of the fruit bats or the mega bats and other species but not so much in this country cool. um someone else has said they've been in jo involved at jones hill a hs2 camp where barbasol bats have been found um, they've read that they need to change roosts every five days when they have pups because of mites. Should any ecologist take this into account? For example, even roosts which need un which seem unoccupied mm. are necessary so that they can breed successfully. I've not heard that with barber cells, so that's interesting. Um, generally, bats are so good at doing their own sort of ectoparasite control and grooming bats and things 
that they will stick to one maternity roost. It obviously costs them so much energy and it's such a risk to move babies between roosts. Um, but no, that's really unusual. Um, very interesting. I would understand why, yeah, in terms of, of parasites and moving, but I've not heard that anywhere. But yeah, if that is the case, then definitely needs to be taken into account. I mean, bats will return generally to the same maternity roost each year. There are some that have been documented for over 70 years as being some places as maternity roosts. There are reasons why they keep coming back to them. Um, each generation teaches the next one to return to it. And then sometimes they'll just change roosts for no apparent reason to us, but there's obviously a reason to them. There's so much that we don't know. But I mean, personally, I would want to err on the side of caution if we don't know what's causing them to change roosts, if we don't know what the sudden change is, but we know that there are these suitable roost spaces that they have used or continue to use, you'd want to make sure that they were available to them especially if you knew that they were a species that was going to have to for their own survival and, and the successful rearing of their offspring to move every few days. Um, yeah, the last question, how did you get into working with bats? Um, so, I, so I first started off volunteering at a wildlife rehabilitation centre. Um, so I sort of just started with all British wildlife, so from hedgehogs to grey seals to birds of prey to tiny mice to all sorts. Um, and then there was only one person there who really specialised in bats because they are more specialists, like some species are. So rearing deer, again, is a more specialist thing. Um, but there was only one person who sort of seemed to do most of the bat care and who knew so much, so much about it and she was really friendly I had so many questions she would take the time to explain to me um, and yeah I just started to fall in love with the stories of them where they'd come from their little characteristics the more time I spent helping her with them the more questions I had the more excited I was the more I found out I mean the more passionate I became about them and wanting to know more and wanting to help them and and do what I could to do that. So it just started as volunteering at a wildlife place. Um, and then I became employed there, but I'd already started doing bats in my own time by then. I'd already approached the Bat Conservation Trust, said that I wanted to help with the helpline, um, started off as kind of a driver. Um, so your, your number gets given out to a member of the public who's found a bat. You drive out, you speak to the member of the public, you work out sort of what needs to happen for the bat or what advice you can offer that individual person um, and then taking them to a carer. And then I began to look after bats for short periods of time. So if they just needed a bit of, sort of TLC for a few days at a time, then I'd do that and then started looking after them for longer and longer. Um, I had the opportunity to go out to Australia as well before COVID, just before COVID, to work with some of the fruit bats over there. So I was working with like the black-headed um, flying foxes mostly and the grey-headed ones, um, which are completely different mega bats compared to working with micro bats. So it was an incredible opportunity. So, um, yeah, it's just it opened up so much when you find something that you're passionate about. But it started off very small. I just sort of stumbled into it and found that I loved these strange little mysterious creatures <laughs> with hands for wings. <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, I guess there's no more questions. So maybe we can finish there. I want to say a massive thank you for coming and talking to everyone. It's been really a pleasure and I feel like I've learnt loads so I oh, assume everyone else has too. I hope so. Oh thank you everyone for the nice uh -huh. in the comments. <laughs> yeah cool. Um, yeah if anyone wants to come to we'll be having more webinars um, they're all completely different but all kind of ecologically minded and <laughs> environmentally activist kind of minded so if anyone wants to get involved they're every almost every Tuesday at 6 p.m um so i'll post some links to that and to our crowd funder for migrant and refugee housing in the chat um just before everyone goes but yeah thanks again um and yeah you. hopefully you'll we'll, we'll all be able to come to some more mm. i'd love to come to one of the bat walks at the farm they sound amazing yeah definitely yeah you and joe should come down it would be yeah well we i don't think 
we'll be doing them for a while just because of lockdown and the weather but yeah yeah usually they're quite frequent exciting mm, thank you so much cool, cool. Bye. thank you that was great thank you very much ah oh, thank you bye everyone <laughs>